with the topic of intranatal and postnatal care this is uh, uh, like important component of this maternal and child health chapter along with this antenatal care so i guess uh, hearing the word intranatal and postnatal you can make out like as the word suggest what it comprises of intranatal is the care during the delivery and postnatal is the care after the delivery course okay so uh, this is the definition it means care taken during the delivery so it consists of the care not only of the uh, mother but also the newborn at the time of the childbirth so what are what will be the objectives for these two cares especially for this intranatal care that is care during delivery is to promote clean and safe delivery and to be ready with the uh, to deal with the complications such as prolonged labor and departmental hemorrhage convulsions mal presentations and prolapse of the cord uh, as you might be knowing that the uh, the main, main chunk of the maternal mortality is like from the complications during the intranatal period that is uh, most uh like um commonest one, one will be one of the commonest is like antepartum hemorrhage then postpartum hemorrhage also then we have uh, some terms called preeclampsia eclampsia so these are uh, like the the complications for which the uh, maternal uh, like the main chunk of maternal mortality comprise of so the thing is now uh, we'll deal with how uh, this intranatal uh, care will prevent these kind of complications and also when when we face this complications how to deal with it okay and then next is to recognize the danger signals and be ready to manage them i think by now you must be knowing about the danger signs that is danger signs of pregnancy so there are few danger signals like specifically which deals during the intranatal period i will be coming in to you with the upcoming slides and then the next is to take immediate and the essential care of the newborn okay then uh, let's continue with the uh, the next objective the next objective which i was explaining was regarding the care of the newborn so this essential care of the newborn is like a pet question of the examiners okay so you need to know uh, like what is this essential care of the newborn and what it deals with so uh, by this we can uh, like this is like the basic care which is provided to the newborn at the time of birth okay like which comprise of the birth resuscitation then the care for the umbilical cord and the care for the eyes so coming to the clean and safe delivery this means preventing or minimizing injury to the mother at the time of birth so what happens we prefer this clean and safe delivery nowadays we prefer to be conducted in the institution okay gone are the days when we used to advise for uh, home delivery by train dies okay this is a very old concept okay the traditional birth attendant that is called dai who conducts at home during uh, at home in rural areas this is a very old concept now we specifically advise the uh, patients to go for the institutional delivery where they can deal with any complications or be ready for any complications thereby reducing the overall mmr that is the maternal mortality rate okay and then the room where delivery is conducted of course should be clean dust free and warm the clean delivery means conducting delivery under the aseptic precautions and safe delivery means causing minimal damage to the mother because previously now of course the neonatal uh, neonatal tetanus and the tetanus for the mother is very low the rate is very prevalence is very low low but the thing is before before uh, what happens the this kind of infections like 
Neonatarium tetanus and then uh, tetanus for the mother were very like common. Okay, so now what happens after this uh, clean delivery was being suggested to the uh, delivery centers, the hospitals, the almost now the prevalence is nil. Okay, for this neonatarium tetanus or tetanus for the mother. Coming to prevention of infections, so uh, how uh, how we are going to prevent the infections? Okay, so the five C's they are term called five C's. That is the five cleans. We have to clean hands before the delivery. We have to clean our hands and of course the fingernails. Then clean surface. Clean surface is the surface where the woman is going to be laid. Okay, for the delivery. That is for clean surface, the clean razor blade, the clean blade will be used for cutting the umbilical cord, okay? As you know, this is the connection between the baby and the mother, isn't it? So, a clean blade will be used for this purpose. The clean ligature, that is to the ligature which is used for tying the open up umbilical cord and then clean cord stamp. So, for the clean cord stamp, uh, we say that we don't, uh, we advise uh, not to put anything over the clean, uh, over the cord stamp. Okay, in India, there are uh, like uh, some practices are very much prevalent, like uh, putting cow dance over, over the cord stamp or putting honey over the cord stamp but this is not advisable okay as a medical professional you should not advise all these kind of stuff which will promote uh, this infections okay so these are the five c's this is important for you so uh, in order to observe these five c's what happens the health department used to give the mother before just before the delivery they used to give a kit okay we call it as the ddk that is the disposable delivery kit in order to promote this five c's okay the contents will be um, comprising of a gauze piece ligature razor blade soap antiseptic lotion cotton so these will be used to promote all these five c's okay so Next, so how uh, these are kept, all these contents which are available, which were mentioned before, are to be placed in a plastic bag, sealed and sterilized by the gamma radiation. Okay. So coming to the uh, domiciliary care, just, this is just for discussion purpose. We, uh, we are not supposed to promote domiciliary care anymore okay domiciliary delivery may be advised if there is a normal obstetric history adequate anc availability of a trained diet and condition at home are helpful this was advised before okay if at all these conditions were favorable that is uh, the woman didn't have any like bad obstetric history she had she, she gives a totally normal obstetric history, no history of any abortions or any prolonged labor before or any postpartum hemorrhage before or any antipartum hemorrhage before. Okay. And then uh, the adequate number of ANCs. The availability of trained birth attendant, this uh, trained birth assistant, you see, and, and condition at home, if it is favorable. So uh, these... Uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of this domiciliary care is the mother will be delivering of course in a family surrounding and then this may tend to remove the fear associated with delivery in a hospital and then also uh, one of the important advantage of this domiciliary care we used to say that the chance for cross infection from other patients will be very low and then also, the mother is able to keep an eye upon her other domestic affairs or her children causing less mental tension for it. But the thing is, there are, there are the benefits are less compared to the risk, okay? The risk will be more. That's why nowadays we don't go for domiciliary care. The disadvantage will have, of course, no one will be there. Of course, the 
if at all the third uh, train but attendant was also there she might not be able to face complications like postpartum hemorrhage or prolonged labor or any other complications so thereby so these were the like main reasons which contributed to the maternal mortality okay and then the mother may have the may have less rest of course she will be at home with her kids she won't be having uh, any adequate rest then then uh, of course she may resume her domestic duties too soon and her diet will be neglected so uh, coming to the danger signals at the time of the delivery so these are the danger signals that is the obstructed labor that is the labor where they have good pains okay but there is no progress so there will be no proper dilatation of the cervix okay although the pains will be proper although the contractions will be there there will be no dilatation of the cervix then next one is the sluggish labor pain for more than 24 hours that is the prolonged labor as we suggest and then bleeding during the labor then prolapse of the cord or hand meconium stain liquor or liquor or slow irregular or excessive fast fetal heart this we specially is uh, very like um, scared of it okay meconium stain liquor because once the uh, liquor is stained that means the, there is some amount of fetal distress inside okay and then that means we have very less time to act upon then collapse during the labor then placenta not separated within half an hour after delivery that is the prolonged third stage of labor we say and then hyperpyroxia pyroxia as we suggest a temperature of more than 38 degrees celsius or over during the labor okay now coming to the institutional care before we used to say that institutional care is recommended to all, to only the high risk cases and where home conditions are unsuitable but now the concept has changed we used to advise institutional care for everyone okay irrespective of the high risk cases irrespective of the conditions of, of home we used to advise uh, institutional care to everyone so the mother here the mother is allowed to rest in bed on the first day after delivery so normally uh, after normal delivery usually we used to discharge the uh, woman after 48 hours of delivery okay that is the normal thing normal concept there are few terms called the rooming in or bedding in so keeping the baby's crib by the side of the mother's bed is called rooming in and the word as the word suggests bedding in is in the keeping the baby in the same bed as the mother okay so there are advantages for this rooming in or bedding in first of all this creates a bonding between the mother and the child okay which is very essential for lactational purpose also Okay, then mothers interested, of course, in breastfeeding usually find that there is a better chance for success with rooming in, and also it allays the fear in the mother's mind that the baby is not displaced in the nursery. Then coming, so that's all for the intranatal care. You have to be thorough with the five C's which I mentioned that that is the five cleans. okay and then questions regarding this rooming in also used to come okay and then you have to know all these danger signals so these are basically the important uh, components of this intranatal care so coming next to the postnatal care as the word suggests of course the care during after the delivery so uh, like uh, i mentioned before this will comprise not only of the mother but it will comprise also of the care of the newborn also so the objectives of the postnatal care are to prevent complications of the postpartum period so can any one of you say oh, what may be the complications for the postpartum period any idea what are the complications what may be the complications in the postpartum period that is the period after the delivery 
okay or there is problem with the involution of the uterus okay and then of course examination of the site of epistotomy if conducted an examination of the lochia okay and then it will be uh, into uh, the breast examination also will be included with it then the second visit the, the that is the second postnatal visit will be on the third day and then the third visit will be on the seventh day we say total that zero uh, the day of the delivery then the third day then seventh day and then the 14th day 21st day 28th day and 42 days of birth will be considered for the postnatal checkups be thorough with this postnatal checkup visits because these are asked usually for your viva purpose okay and then there are significance uh, why these visits are made particularly during this third day seventh day 42nd day okay you have to know about it so third day is basically to um, see if at all there is physiological jaundice okay uh, for the baby of course physiological jaundice of course you might be knowing that it is very common for the newborn isn't it so if at all this physiological jaundice persists beyond this third day then we will be terming this as pathological jaundice okay and then seventh day will be uh, assessing the umbilical cord of the child okay by seventh day that is the first week of life the uh, umbilical cord usually shrivels and comes out okay if at all it doesn't come out by the seven day or beyond seven day that means we can suspect some amount of infection over there okay and then we'll additionally we'll be asking about the bleeding per vaginum or foul smelling discharge because if at all the lochia the lochia as such is um, like uh, physiological okay we have three types of lochia lochial discharge you will be knowing more in your ops and gynae classes so if at all this uh, lochia starts to becoming uh, foul smelling we suspect some kind of infection okay and along with it they will be assessing this breast tenderness and pain or at all or fever at all okay and then previously only four visits we used to uh, say that it's mandatory okay that is the uh, the, the first day that is the day of delivery that is the zero day third day seventh day and last is 42nd day that is the last day that is the end end of the purpurium purpurial phase we used to say okay but now we have added this three more visits okay this is the 14th day 21st day and the 28th day and along with it the 42nd day so these days are also added this is for uh, like checking whether the baby is growing properly is it having adequate uh, weight gain or the adequacy of lactation whether the baby is taking feeding feedings properly or not so these visits are added because of it okay then the next coming to the postnatal advices so some of the important advices the mother is given is about the nutrition because as we know both the pregnant woman and a uh, lactating mother needs additional calories isn't it so during the lactation period the woman needs actually more calories during even the antenatal period also so here uh, we say that during the first six months the woman will be ad uh, needing additional 600 kilocalorie okay and then for the next six months the woman will be needing 520 kilocalorie and then she is advised on a light diet on first day the diet rich in calories proteins iron calcium and vitamins and then <coughs> next the advice will be on the personal hygiene of course to prevent the infections then advice given regarding the rooming in i think you must by now you must be uh, like um, knowing the term called kangaroo mother care 
Any idea what is this kangaroo mother care? No, I think it is keeping the baby near the stomach. Not only stomach, it is the skin to skin care. Okay, so uh, as the word suggests, kangaroo mother care. So can the father give this kangaroo mother care? Yes, yes, yes certainly, certain, because, because even father can, can keep, keep the baby attached, attached to his skin. skin. Okay, okay, fine. The uh, even the anyone can give this kangaroo mother care. This is basically to prevent hypothermia. Okay, hypothermia is uh, like very common for the newborn, as it takes time to adapt to the general conditions isn't it because the inside temperature that is inside the mother's womb the temperature is much more than the temperature outside isn't it so this is this kangaroo mother care we advise uh, basically to prevent this hypothermia okay and then next one is uh, comprising of advisors for the breastfeeding so this Regarding breastfeeding, the uh, the medical professional will be getting the maximum complaints. Okay, the initial days, mother will be complaining of not enough milk. Okay, this is one of the commonest complaint which is given by the mother to the doctor. So what you need to advise is that whatever it comes out during the initial phase. Basically, we say that is the colostrum, isn't it? The first milk for the baby. So this, the amount, whatever it comes out, it is very much sufficient for the baby. Although she thinks, she might be thinking that it is very less. So uh, can we give some extra uh, like milk from the uh, like uh, from the packet, packeted milk, of course. So that you uh, you have to counsel the family and the mother that sufficient amount of colostrum, whether it looks less, whatever, less or more, this, is, this will be adequate for the baby and she has to continue the suckling. The baby should suckle, okay, continue suck, suckle. This will be like um, increasing the, this is like somewhat called the lactational reflex, okay. More the suckling reflex will be there more amount of milk will be produced okay so uh, usually in our indian scenario we have seen that uh, this colostrum is usually discarded okay thinking that it is bad bad discharge or bad milk but the thing is we have to advise or counsel the patient party that although it looks yellowish this is not bad okay this thick this thick milk is the first uh, milk which the baby should be having, okay, because this is very rich in protective antibodies. Okay, then there are practices of giving prelectal peas also. In Indian scenario, we have seen that this honey is one of the favorite components for this prelectal pea, but lots of disadvantages are associated with the prelectal feeding practice. And we have to discourage this practice, okay? Then exclusive breastfeeding, that is only breast milk and not even water, must be ad advocated or advised to the mother for the first six months. And after six months, we have to advise that she can give start giving the complementary feeding. And this breastfeeding should be done on demand, okay? At the age of six months, breast milk, as I have already mentioned, should be supplemented by additional foods. Okay. And then how to check for adequacy of breastfeeding. So there are few signs by which we know that the child is getting uh, adequate breastfeeding. One is the proper gain in weight. Okay. The weight gain will be adequate for the baby if at all he is having adequate breast milk. And the next is he will be fasting urine. Around like the average amount of fasting of urine will be 8 times per day. Okay. So if at all this is less, 
If at all uh, he or she is passing urine two or three times in a day, that means he or she is not getting adequate breastfeeding. And then after the feed, the baby will be relaxed, okay, either he will be sleeping, but at least not crying. If at all the child is continuously crying and even after feed, the child is restless, that means he or she is not getting adequate, uh, adequate breast milk. Okay, and then the amount of stool also. The stool also will be for the newborns. The stool is not usually not solid. Okay, but if at all the child is not getting uh, adequate breast milk, the stool will be hard. Okay, and then the post dental advices regarding the family planning methods. So you have to advise the family, that is mainly the couple, to at least go for three years gap, okay? Three years gap they should at least have for the next baby. And if at all they want to terminate this, uh, I mean they want to go for terminal procedure, you can give advices regarding this terminal procedure, that is regarding the laparoscopic tubectomy and NSV also you can suggest. Nowadays, there are schemes for this family planning where they, where they usually get money if they go for this family planning methods. Okay, and then you can suggest for this postpartum IUCD, PPIUCD as we mentioned, with these are all the spacing methods. Okay, and then usually we don't advise this oral pills that is the uh, mala D or mala N uh, to the lactating mother because these hormones will be suppressing the lactation. Okay, and then this birth spacing, as I have like uh, given uh, importance to this word, that is the birth spacing. Why there should be birth spacing of at least three three years is that in order to uh, decrease the risk of maternal complications, uh, which uh, which is due to the depletion of maternal reserve of iron, calcium and other essential micronutrients because after the uh, this delivery, mother tends to lose a great amount of, a large amount of uh, blood, isn't it? So, and usually the Indian women, they like uh, almost half of them suffer from iron deficiency anemia and, uh, and additionally after delivery they become more anemic isn't it so in order to uh, like be prepared for the next pregnancy they sh they, sh they should be like adding uh, like uh, adding to this reserve of iron and other essential micronutrients okay this prevents in general we say that prevents maternal depletion that promotes general health then promotes health of the child, that is, she can take care of the child which is already being born, then reduces the maternal and uh, morbidity and mortality because most of the maternal morbidity and mortality in the Indian scenario is because of iron deficiency anemia. And then reduces the incidence of low birth weight. This is also one consequences of iron deficiency anemia of the mother that she used to give birth to a low birth weight child. Okay. And then in turn reducing perinatal and infant death. And then we can um, advise them of some postnatal exercises which will restore the ligaments and tissues and muscles back to the pre gravid state. And then advices regarding uh, when can she resume sexual intercourse. And then also one of the most important component comprise of the immunization of the baby. Okay. So that's all for today's class. Uh, this is a very important chapter for this comprise of uh, like mainly the viva questions. Okay. So you need to be thorough with this postnatal care and then intranatal care. And of course this... ANC cases uh, you you people used to get for your family visit visits, but along with it you will get questions for intranatal and the postnatal care. Okay.